Everybody has a story and every story needs to be heard to learn from others' mistakes, be inspired by their journeys, and be challenged to apply what we learn from them is how we grow as leaders and as individuals. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Today, I'm speaking with Dwayne Esmond, the Associate Director at the Ellen White Estate and the primary editor as well. So they say. So they say. <laughs> Dwayne, you and I go back yes, we a do. number we do. of years. Yeah. I actually remember my first week here at the GC, mm -hmm. um, seeing you in morning worship mm -hmm. and getting one of your hugs and some really phenomenal advice. Really? Yes. Just you know, you give Please it every tell once me in a you while. Did not listen to what I, I absolutely did. And and it worked. It it has worked it so far. To, it had to be. It has gone. worked so far. <laughs> um, and it was to. It, I'll actually tell you what it was because uh -huh. it it was really good advice. Um, was to not get disillusioned. Mm. That everybody here are just normal people, mm. not to allow myself to get disillusioned. Okay, that's something I would have told you. Yeah, yeah it is. that's what I tell myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, actually, it's part of the reason why we have this very podcast oh, is so that people can know who we are. Yes. So yes. that it's yeah. very it's very easy to get caught up in like, oh, they're the leaders mm -hmm. or whatever. And we're just normal people mm -hmm. who've been called to serve in this position right. for this period of time. Because pretty soon someone else will come and they'll serve Absolutely. in the same same positions Absolutely. and we'll move to somewhere else. That's right. Um, but that's not how we, we actually go back a number of years. Way before that. Yes. Um, you were friends with my husband before I knew my husband. That is correct. And um, <laughs> I'd love the story to be like, and you introduce us. But that's literally not at all what happened. So. <laughs> I would like to write it that way, but it'd it be a fun be a story. It would it'd be, be a, a fun lie. story. Um, we don't lie. Um, not, not on this podcast. This is a very authentic, real podcast. Amen, amen, amen. So, Dwayne, at that time, you were working for Insight Magazine. Yes. As the editor. Yes. And um, helping try to connect with our youth. Mm -hmm. We're going to get there, sure. but let's start a, a number of years before that. Mm. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. Who is Dwayne sure. Esmond and where'd you come from? Oh, man. Well, I would like to tell you that I fell from heaven. <laughs> I Sorry. Was the... I think I know you too well already. <laughs> <laughs> that I was, uh, you know, some special creation of God. Uh, well, I still I do true. believe I am. <laughs> But in reality, I was born in South America. I was born in Guyana. I'm Guyanese by birth. Really? Um, I don't know if you even knew that. I didn't. You, you didn't is, even see that? No, see, I you love know, this already. As long as we have known each <laughs> other, you don't even know that about. So, but yeah, that's where I was born. Uh, my parents emigrated to the States uh, when I was very young. I grew up really in the state of New Jersey, um, North, uh, North Joysey, some Joysey. would say. Joysey. Um, and I, I, my family is very much uh, has the story of an immigrant family trying to make it. My parents really emigrated to the States uh, to give us Christian education. SDA Christian education was on their mind. So were you born in Guyana, though? I was born in Guyana. Okay, so how, yeah. how old were you when you moved? When I moved, I was about 10 years old. All right, so you actually have memories oh, yeah, from I have Guyana. Memories. Yeah, I do. So I do. what what I was do. that upbringing like oh, in it Guyana? Was a, it was amazing. I mean, Guyana is a very, in my mind, a very beautiful country. Some of those sweetest people. I mean, some of the nicest people. I think on the planet live in that in that little country. It's right at the top of uh, of South America, um, and realistically, uh, a guy by the name of Jim Jones. Uh, oh, made it famous. I he do, probably sadly. put Guyana on the map more let's, than let's, anyone let's, else. Let's we'll, let's let's replace we'll, Jim Jones with Dwayne Esmond. We'll, <laughs> New plan. Let's let's do that. I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> but I remember uh, my father pastoring. My dad was a pastor there. Uh, he also worked for the local Guyanese conference as a conference treasurer for several years. Um, and I remember just going places with my parents, my siblings, you know, ministering with them, 
um, just enjoying a tropical country with lots of fresh fruit. And, you know, that that's my memory of 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 my my boyhood home. And it, I would say that even today it has shaped it still shapes me. Um, there are certain sensitivities I have about things, about people, about places, about how different people from different places are seen, welcomed in, loved, um, that are a result of, of where I'm from. Yeah. So were you going to Avenue schools while you were in Guyana? No. We were in, uh, we were in public education at the time. There weren't really any Avenue schools there. So my parents, you know, trying to follow uh, uh, God's counsel and spirit of prophecy. My father's an average, avid, avid uh, reader of spirit of prophecy, and uh, he kind of passed that on to me. Um, but that kind of shaped their orientation as far as education go, uh, went. And so they wanted us to be in a place where we could experience that, where we could be in schools, where we could be trained and learn and, and have character education, not just, you know, the three R's, but really character education was what they were all about. So yeah. your father and mother decide to move from we Guyana mm -hmm. to America. Yes. Now, did he continue being a pastor here in America? Did he get like a call to like pastor in joy -Z? He, he did. He did not. No, it was not a call that brought us. We came. Um, he was not able to really um, get a position with, with the conference or anywhere else. He was not picked up. Um, I think he did attempt, but, but was not. Um, he was just from a different place. And so with his background in um, finance and, and, uh, and accounting, he became an accountant, worked nights uh, for different organizations. I remember him working n forever at night. Um, and so my parents just kind of got started. And sure enough, within a, a short while, you know, we were all uh, heading to Adventist schools. I remember one time they had just about all of us, there's five of us, and at least four of us were in some some part of the Adventist education system wow. all at once. And my mom was a homemaker, um, a CNA, uh, helping people here and there. Um, so she was, you know, doing what she could. Uh, and my dad was out trying to earn what he could. But they were very committed to helping us get uh, Christian education. Four children in Adventist education. Mm -hmm. That's a commitment. That's a commitment. I have three kids oh, yeah. in Adventist education, you, and I'm going to tell you it's, you it's know. a commitment. You know. Um, one child alone is a commitment. <laughs> one is, I've got one, and um, that's it's a serious commitment. It's an expensive commitment. It, it is. It's yeah. a worthwhile commitment. But it, Not because Adventist education is perfect, it, and we both know that. Oh, absolutely. But, but, um, it pays. It pays. It pays. Um, so did you go to... Um, uh, Garden State Academy? Actually, I knew of Garden State Academy, but I actually went to Pine Forge Academy. Okay. I, so, I went to Blue Mountain Academy. Uh, so we were I, in, it's the we're only in the same, academies in all of North America yes. that are in the same county. Yes, they're right there. Yep. Um, I knew Blue Mountain. We would, we would come to the campus of Blue Mountain on, on occasion. Pine they would Forge come to Singers. Us. I'm yes. going to tell you, there's like nobody, <laughs> nobody yeah, the choir, like the, the choir, Pine Forge Choir. The choir has been amazing. I was a member of that choir for years, too. See, that I, was awesome. I, I could tell. You um, had that in you. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I pray so. But it was it, it was a wonderful moment. I went to Pine Forge actually my last two years, uh, junior and senior year uh, of high school was when I was there. And really, it was at Pine Forge that I think my spiritual life really changed. Um, I was headed down some not so good roads, so I was I was into hip hop big time when I when I hit my teenage years. I so, can actually see that. Um, I, can you see <laughs> I that? I can actually see that. I am I am so afraid. Right? Okay. I I thought I killed all of that. Uh, no, but I could just you know. So I was you know I, seventh and eighth grade. I'm in Adventist school, um, and it was actually in Adventist school that. Um, I kind of got with some friends and we started rapping here and there and doing little things, you know. Uh, we had a little group. We would, we would battle other guys and rapping. And so, like, hip hop was all in my head. You know, I still remember some of the acts of that day. Um, and I, I don't know, my, my parents 
uh, were like, you know what, we we got to get you, we got to get you out the city. You know, you you're really having some problems, and so my parents saved and and did whatever they needed to do to send me to Pine Forge Academy. And all of a sudden, I was out there on the rolling hills of you know <laughs> Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania County. with nothing in you know no music anything in sight anywhere um and it was there that God began to really arrest my attention in fact before I left to go off to school my father let me take a couple of books out of his library you know he doesn't he doesn't part with Ellen White books and 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 things very easily but he let me take my character and personality the two volumes set volumes one and two along with my bible of course and those books really changed my life. Um, it was in those books that I read about um, how diet affects the mind, affects the temperament, the power of Bible study, and how it transforms your thinking and your grasp, your ability to grasp all other subjects. Um, she talks about the affections and the emotions. And I mean, it was just so much excellent information in there that it began to just like change my whole life. All of a sudden I was, I was saying to myself, and I think the Holy Spirit was saying to me, hey, you know, you, you can make a real serious change right now in your life, if you're willing, um, and, and go in a whole different direction. And I started to make that change, which I'm still working on today, but it's it started there. It's a lifelong there. process, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it started there. Uh, so you said that, you know, when you were in Guyana, mm -hmm. um, you know, your father always loved spirit of prophecy. He was a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you had this family history of working for the church. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like in those years when you came to America, you, you were mm -hmm. in New Jersey and all this, did you ever push back against this, like the the stuff that you kind of were raised with, mm. like the spirit of prophecy? Mm. You know, like we all mm. sometimes the, the, the things that we love, it. yeah, like yeah. later in life, and the things that our yeah. parents love, we kind yeah. of push sure. back against. I think there's Did a natural, there's a natural, uh, you know, there, there's a saying that <laughs> that when you, you know, if you've got a bunch of uh, cows, you know, fenced in they will sometimes rub against the fence to find a weak spot to get out. And they'll test that whole fence until <laughs> they find one area that's loose, they're out, you know. Um, so yes, there were times when I, when I, when I rubbed against it. Uh, but I would say I never got to the point where I was anti anything. Um, I was just, and I think it had a lot to do with what happened in high school. I made a a serious change there and so I was never one of these people who was like anti God or anti the church or not it and that's not to say I like everything I remember being in in at my local church and you know that's when like the music wars were happening you mm, know I remember those. bands come in you know when when if if a, if a you know, a drum set got into the church. It was it was Hades. You know, it, those those kinds of issues were majorly. I think we're a thing. I think we're in school around the same time. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> I remember one time there was a choir that came to our church, and uh, and they were a gospel choir, so they were you know quite expressive in their worship and one of our more conservative members he was the first elder at the time was not comfortable with that choir and how they were singing and he stopped the whole concert he just stopped the afternoon ay concert and just ended it and i remember the impact that had on me as a as a child in what manner it all of a sudden i had a problem with the church I had a problem with with that brand of Adventism that was not even kind, you know? Okay, so you have an issue. Um, this is not, you're not comfortable with what you're seeing. You, you might not even, I'm not sure he was able to articulate spiritually why he made the decision he made. He just he felt made. that he way. He just felt his... that way, and he implemented it. And I think it had a, a, a very uh, deleterious effect on the faith of of the young people of the church at that time. I'm not. I don't mean to say that it was all, it was not all that way. I remember. I remember the, the the elder in my church who every Sabbath when I was a kid would took a liking to me and would give me five dollars, you know, and just tell me how much he loved me. And 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 the other elder who recently passed away uh, would say he would call me Doctor Esmond when I was a child. He made me actually dream that I could be something that I never 
that had not crossed my mind. That's what he would call me. You're going to be a doctor one day. I know it, you know, and I'm working on that Ph.D. right now. And I he still rings in my head. So I, I had the experience of having people in my life who were committed Adventists, love you in your corner, you know, run the young people all over the world for whatever they needed to do. You know, they want to go skating or horseback or whatever they want to do. I've, I've had those kinds of people. But in any church, you also have the other kind of people, the other people mm -hmm. who who may not understand how to apply biblical principles in the most healthy way. Um, and I just thank God that I had the balance. Um, I had some parents who loved me. And, and so I think that helped me not to get off into tangents. The other thing that helped me, my friend, is that I was active. Let's I, explore that. What were you doing for the church? I was doing stuff in church, man. I was, I was a member, you know, working within my, my Adventist Youth Society at the time, or MV, you know, Missionary Volunteers, AY. I was active. Um, I was, you know, in the Pathfinder Club. Um, we would just our church you know would go and do outings and we had socials and all those kinds of things just kept me very active and involved in church i, I remember one time um we had an ay program and the youth you know the youth have to memorize things and you know say it and and i was supposed to say the lord's prayer and I got I got about I knew it. I got about halfway through and then realized I was talking to the whole church and <laughs> I absolutely freaked out. I mean, I, I just I lost it. I went blank. No words came. And and, you know, it's bad when the saints start start trying to talk you through the <laughs> the, 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 the scripture. So they begin to, to, to speak it, man. They begin to, to quote, you know, the Lord's Prayer and help me along. And then they gave me a standing ovation for what they did, you know, because I didn't do anything. <laughs> You know, they gave me a standing ovation for what they did and and just kind of like loved on me, even though I failed. You know, what I mean, I, I didn't I've quote unquote failed. I, I didn't do that great uh, as I would expect. And what a beautiful I knew it. testimony, though, to a church empowering somebody in an awkward moment, because that moment, if if like they had kind of responded in a different yes. way, could have made it so you never want to get up front again. And Please instead, they just. Me. Came around that, you and loved on you. That is a fact. What you just said. I think I tell people, I I stand before people today and speak because of moments like that at that church. Yep. I had a safe environment in which to fail. I had people. You know, I was still gonna get great food after this was over. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there would the potluck would still be on fleek when I'm done, and I would still like be loved. You know what I mean? I would still be loved. I'm, all my friends would still be there, and we would still be encouraged. You know, I think that's such an important thing for us to think about, um, is that the way we respond to people in the church, mm -hmm. the other elder, I think, was is probably well-meaning. He, Absolutely. He, he, he wasn't doing something in a venture. No, thing. He, was he was trying not. to do what he believed was right Correct. in his heart. Correct. Um, although it, you know, probably creates some... Mm -hmm other issues within our young people. He was doing the best he could. Sure. And sometimes you have to give a little grace. You do. It's harder as teenagers to give that grace because mm -hmm. you don't understand mm -hmm. it. Um, but even as adults, we somehow forget to give mm -hmm. grace to people. But I love this story of just a church, the importance of, of how a church treats their young people mm -hmm. And the leaders that they are shaping unknowingly because of their behavior. It's true. It's it's a I, I love it. And obviously we know you have no problem talking these days. <laughs> well I mean you might get you might get a little nervous, <laughs> but do. it doesn't show. Well thank so, you. So um so you go to Pine Forge Academy. Yes, ma'am. And um you said it's there where you start having this relationship. I actually my junior in academy mm. was what um I actually bought four Spirit of Prophecy books myself. Good for you. And um, 
I those books actually were very meaningful to my journey. So it's interesting mm-hmm. how you said my character and personality because mm-hmm. actually one of them was volume one of my oh, character and personality. Nice. I have no idea why I decided to. I picked I, up like Adventist Home. I'm like a 17 year old. Why am I picking up Adventist Home? Right? Like my character and personality. But I you're not remember. hearing like Steps to Christ, no. Desire, you know, Christ Object Lesson, Desire. All right. To be fair, I had read Steps to Christ at oh, this good for point. You. Um, I had not. <laughs> but it was a very, it's a weird assortment, yes. but like, I feel like God brings to us what we need at exactly. the right time. Exactly. I, I probably would not have recommended those books to mm-hmm. normal, mm-hmm. like generally, but God knew that was what we apparently mm-hmm. needed. Absolutely. So you come to, to Pine Forge and, um, mm-hmm. you know, would you say that, cause you said kind of Pine Forge was kind of like this, this turning Transition point. point. Mm-hmm. Would you say there was a defining moment? Because I think, you know, sometimes people have like this story like, you know, and then I sat here and then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, this (laughs) happened. Or sometimes it's like, no, it just was a a progression. Like, Mm -hmm. was there a defining moment kind of for you while you're at Pine Forge? I don't I don't think there was a specific defining moment. It was more like a slow boil. It was like God just kept turning the temperature little by little as i read um he just turned it singing in the choir Mm. we used to sing a song called god and god alone i cannot tell you the impact of that song on me um we usually sang it it was the last song we would sing one time we were singing it in a very hot church in Florida and we like collapsed. <laughs> like half the choir fell off the stage, <laughs> passed out. But because we just I mean, it is it is insane how how powerful it is. And I remember, you know, singing that song and we all would look forward to singing it. It just mm-hmm. meant so much to us then. I would see, you know, people who were in attendance in tears, especially older people, seniors who would just weep, you know, as we sang. And then I was, fast forward now many years later, I remember sitting at a graduation a few years ago at Pine Forge Academy and the choir sang Mm. that song. And as they began to sing, I began to cry Mm -hmm. and I, I had come full circle. I understood after doing some living what it is when it's only God. Yeah. When sometimes all you have is God. But God and God alone is enough. Amen. He will be the truth of our eternal home. He's our our one desire. Our hearts will never tire of God and God alone. It's talking about being with God and in his presence and having him all to ourselves once and for all, for eternity. And even down here, we can have that experience. For me, you know, moments like that with the choir um, and just uh, God just putting me I think in an environment where I could be seasoned there were some other things I picked up there that wasn't that great I picked up some other things but I got some major core things put in place it was there for instance that I decided to make a change in diet you know I I I had a a nutrition class and my my teacher and the nutrition teacher showed us a video of like how meat is raised and you know the slaughterhouses <laughs> She cured. She cured me immediately. I mean, I don't. I'm not trying to look down my nose at anyone now, you know. Because it's I, your I, personal I've, I've journey. Got, it's my journey. I've got my struggles, you know. And I, every now and again, some things happen to me too. But after watching that and then reading what Ellen White says about diet and the mind and diet and spirituality, and now understanding it much, much, much more deeply um, in terms of health ministry, I just. I just said, all right, I'm going to try. Now, I'm going back to a house where, like, you know, these are some, my parents love the Lord. They're SOP reading people, but there's a meat, there's meat all over the place, you know, the, right? I find cultural context makes a exactly. difference. Like, exactly. That's my, that's it was my harder culture. to be vegetarian in many countries. Yes. So. That was, that's yeah. my culture. It's how my parents, when I raised that Venice, you know, it's so, but when I came home, and my mother understood my stand 
this is another moment right here, okay? This is a moment. Tweet this. Tweet this. So <laughs> let me grab my phone. <laughs> my, my mother, man, she decided to support my spiritual journey in her pots. <laughs> so <laughs> she began to make food just for me. And then it started to change the whole house. She started to change the diet of the whole house because I was trying to eat right. Hmm. And I'm just going to tell you, for me, that was amazing that my mother would do that. That she wanted me, she, you know, she made the sacrifices to put me in the school. If I was beginning to change and move in the right direction, they were all about She'll supporting support it. You. It was all about that. You know, I, I, I love what you said about choir. I, I genuinely think that music mm. is one of the ways God uses to really oh, reach us. Because I was also in choir, and our song was When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. <gasps> that song? I know. Listen right? Right? to me. Right? Um, Listen, and I remember. That song. It's so. Like, because the thing is, you can have a choir teacher, and then you can have a choir yes, teacher. You know yeah, what I mean? I know exactly. And what I had you Mr. Mean. Bowler and this uh, choir teacher when we sang "When I Survey." That that was another the one. wondrous cross. Mm. And I went back to mm -hmm. my alumni weekend, and because you're in the travel choir, you get to come up and sing <laughs> it. You know, they bring in the alumni who, at some point, have lost the octave range that they used to, but we still like to pretend that we're first sopranos. Um, I'm a second. Well, I was a second soprano. Pretty sure I'm not anymore, unless I have a lot of warm up time, mm -hmm. maybe. But um, I, th till this day, when I hear that, oh. it moves me. And a friend of mine, life changing, found a video. Like, so a friend of mine from here, who I'd never met before, <laughs> had a video of my senior year performance because oh, no. he remembered that he had been to that alumni weekend and he oh. dredged it up. And actually, he had focused on me for a few oh. minutes of this performance. And he was like, I focused on you because I could tell the music like captured your soul. Oh, wow. And music is such a powerful thing. And I would say my choir experience is mm -hmm. also one of the things that helped me have a stronger faith. I think so. So I, I think that there is a powerful thing to be said about music and uh, we really apparently need to like put a lot more mm -hmm. money behind our um, mm -hmm. choir directors because mm -hmm. obviously, you know. Life changing. Th it's a life changing yeah. experience. And it is. I can still sing all of Handel's Messiah, Second Soprano <laughs> Part, without a book. Okay? Like, I know where you come in. I know when you shut up. Um, like, it's, it's oh, amazing. That's rich. because Because that's yes. what music can do to music you. Can it do transforms that. you. It teleports you. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So you go thing. from Pine Forge, though. I do. And I'm going to. Yes. Oakwood? I, I, I go to Oakwood. You went to Oakwood. Went to Oakwood. Okay. So you went to Oakwood. Now, when you went to Oakwood, mm. did you know what you wanted to be? You know what? I was not. I, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I was pretty good in writing and all things English. So what are pretty you Pretty good with arguing. Yeah. I that, kind of think that, that you could be. That 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 was a gift. <laughs> so <laughs> one of my other spiritual gifts, argument. So We'll call it Discussion. <laughs> discussion. He's very good at discussing right, his right. points. His point of view. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and my parents used to say, you, you know, you're going to have a child one day. Give oh. it time. That's what they would say to me because of that that penchant yeah, that I, I had. I laugh. I think God, God laughed <laughs> God when he gave has, me exactly what I asked for. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. He certainly I'm does. Telling you. And our children so, are proof of they it. Are, they are making me pay for the sins of my youth. Uh, but. What was powerful to me was I, I didn't come. I came, of course, with that idea. But I prayed before I got there. And I asked God for some things. I said, Lord, there are two things I want out of this school. I want, I want the career that you want for me, whatever will bring you glory. I really prayed that prayer in between my senior year of high school and freshman year of college. And then I asked him for the person I was supposed to spend my life with. I said, Lord, I want two things from this school. Those two things. Anything else you want to throw in there, great. But I want those two things. So I hear purpose and passion. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Ooh, I like the way you put that. So I got there and, 
you know, I'm matriculating and I meet the girl who would become my wife. I meet her freshman Kemba. year. I met Kemba freshman year. Um, and we we dated the the entire time. Really? So from? From freshman year until today. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, I'm sure so you still date her. <laughs> I'm trying to date her. Um, but it is it was just amazing that God really answered those prayers. So I, I ended up majoring in English. I had a history and political science minor, headed to law school. Um, but then God does what God does. <laughs> you know, God says, uh-huh. Well, if that will get you, you know, if that focus will help you to get certain things in place, I'll, I'll switch that around at the appropriate time. So I'm coming now, matriculated through. I'm still practicing some of the same stuff, I, things that God taught me in, in, in academy about my relationship with him. And they're born fruit. I'm doing well in school. Um, I graduated pretty high in my class. I'm the senior class president at this time at Oakwood. So God is blessing. I uh, had some interesting experiences. Uh, my senior year, I ran out of money. Um, and God did something amazing. Um, I, I, I was not in school, but because I was so um, respected by faculty and staff, you know, the deans let me stay in the dormitory. I had no cash. They let me stay. Um, and then I got back. When I got back into school, um, trying to finish out my year, I had to double up on courses and things. I had, even during that time when I was out, there were professors who would bring me food at the dormitory. I'm talking about, this is why, you know, when people get all upset and they're getting ready to go ballistic on the Seventh-day Adventist church, I, I'm probably not going to be an ally. I'm not going to be one of your people. I'll critique it, but I'm going to love it <laughs> because it has blessed. These are people who are committed, who blessed me. You understand that the church is not perfect because it's not made up of humans. I'm not, because I'm in it. <laughs> if they let me in, it can't be perfect. You know what I mean? But we have a perfect God. Amen. And we have an absolutely, absolutely powerful message. And we have a calling and a purpose. And if you get about that, you won't have time to fuss around with all of the issues. Right? Not that we don't have to deal with them. We have to deal with them. And they matter. And Many they of matter. Them matter. And, and, and God calls us to, to live out the full, the full blessing of this, of this movement, this calling. So we don't, we, don't, we don't shy away from hard discussions. We don't shy away from the realities. We should face them. But more, it is more important the attitude in which we come than our positions on, on different subjects. Yeah. Because if your attitude is wrong, you're wrong with God. It doesn't matter how you say that again? The, if your attitude is wrong, it doesn't matter how theologically right you are. It doesn't matter what your position is if your attitude is wrong. If you are not seeking common ground, if you are not seeking to be redemptive as you discuss, if you're not seeking to to to, to actually come into fellowship with each other even as we discuss things if we if we just got to go our separate ways all the time sometimes you do have to go you know Paul and and, and Barnabas had to go separate mm -hmm. ways that happens in ministry but I'm saying there's some people concocting reasons for us just to separate just to go in opposite directions. And I don't believe in that in God's church. I believe God's people are called to bring the right attitude to discussions and then seek ways that we can walk together in ministry and finish the Lord's work. That's that's umbrella thinking, but that's how I think. So, but for, for me, I've seen people who have loved me in this church. I could tell you stories about the other side of stuff that, that's happened to me. I've, I mean, because I Because it has happened. I'm a black man in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I've worked in institutions that were pre uh, predominantly white. I have experienced people who are racist or have racial ide racist ideation, some consciously, some unconsciously. What am I supposed to do with that? Get mad and, and, and blame God? No. I think I'm supposed to stand up for what is right. I think I'm supposed to work to love those people to see common ground with them, to see how we can move together in ministry. And if they see something in me that's wrong, I'm supposed to give them permission to call me out. But if, if I just get into my little uh, mindset and just 
you know, everything else, paint everything else with a certain brush because of what I have experienced in one or two occasions or more, then I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair to the church. I don't think that's fair to, to, to the people who make up this church. You I've know, said a I, lot. No, I, I love it because I'm a female working for the church. I understand. The fact of the matter is that we have 20 over 22 million members mm -hmm. in this church. The most diverse church and, on the planet. And let's just say that I've had bad experiences with a hundred people. Mm -hmm. Am I really going to throw 22 million people like under the bus? I'm not doing it. Um, because I've had, as for every situation I've had that have been, has been negative, mm -hmm. and I have I've had some. We all have crazy things happen. Yes. Um, I've had dozens of incredible positive interactions. Like what you're saying with these professors. I mean, they nobody need, they could have kicked you out. They don't have to do that. They, they did not need to, to take care of you. But the fact of the matter is that you are their son. You are That's their how brother. They saw me. And, um, that to me is the beauty of Amos education. Not that it is perfect, but that what we were trying to do, mm -hmm. What we try to do is take care of the holistic person. We try to care about you as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, my teachers, you know, it's very hard to define sometimes what mm -hmm. keeps us in the church. Mm -hmm. But it sounds to me like education mm -hmm. was a huge thing for you. It was for me. And it's like mm -hmm. not because it was perfect, but because there were so many there times where we saw mm -hmm. God yes. within the church. Yes. God put people in my way who who have blessed my life. And it started within the educational structure. Recently, my my uh, vice director of the White Estate, Tim Elder, uh, Tim Poirier, sent me an email. He said, Dwayne, there's someone trying to reach you. He, he emailed the White Estate. Here's his email. It was my seventh grade, my seventh grade teacher oh. from Advent from my from Trinity Temple Academy in Newark, New Jersey. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore changed my life. Mr. Moore changed my life. He had seen me. I guess I, I, I had spoken, I'd been asked to speak at recent GC session, mm -hmm. and so he had seen that and just wrote me. I mean, it just, I cannot tell you how I felt that Mr. Moore was proud of me, even at this age, because of what he tried to do with us when we were in his class, the time he took, the encouragement, the spiritual encouragement just he was the, he was one of those people so for me I, I i number one not only have i benefited but i want to be one of those people i'm trying to be one yep. of those people yep. with other young people that i've mentored and worked with in ministry i have people that come by this building here at the general conference and they at times would call me and say, hey, Dwayne, we have somebody at the front desk uh, needing some help. <laughs> you know, I could tell you a story right now of someone like that. Um, and I all those people who reached out and helped me are still in my head. They're still with me. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like it's our responsibility to shepherd this truth forward. Now, m my issue is, th this is this is God's church. I believe that with all my Amen. heart. This is God's church. I like to call it mine, but it's really God's church. And so it is important to me that I be careful what I say about it. Hmm. I'm not here on anybody's agenda. I'm just telling you, this is Dwayne Esmond. Take it or leave it. This is who I am. We should have had a disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, put put the put <laughs> the a disclaimer big on this. on this podcast. Put all, a big disclaimer. All, th all thoughts are just of <laughs> Dwayne as you know, These are Dwayne's <laughs> personal views. They don't. They do not represent the views of the white estate or the general. You know, put put all that on it. These are just mine. I am not. I I don't get down with tearing down the church. I don't get down with tearing down things that God has established. Neither did David when God established Saul. Mm. He didn't get down with it either. And that same Jesus who had to rebuke those Pharisees
for their, their misappropriation of faith was also a person who affirmed faith. So it's important for me for us to have balance yeah, and for us to remember that God's doing it's, great it's things. It's okay for us to challenge things. It's okay for us to speak out on things. But what is the purpose? Is it for edification or for tearing down? Correct. And today there's... Yeah, there's that, that so line. much tension with this, and yeah, and line. you can you can see people who it's it's we they have somehow decided that the only way for the church to to continue forward is for it to be rebuilt in their own vision. Mm-hmm. I know that's going to get some tweets there, mm-hmm. but like it's not it's not ours. It's not no, my it's, church. It's, it's God's mine. church. There are things I want to change. Yeah, things it I want to change. It ain't, it ain't going to change, <laughs> right? <laughs> So nope, definitely not. <laughs> and, and maybe God knows. No, we can't. We can't definitely really do can't what Dwayne wants. So, <laughs> let's, so let's just keep it going a different way. And I'm okay with. I'm. I. I'm. All I'm saying is, Alyssa, I trust the Holy Spirit. That's all Amen. I'm saying. I trust the Holy Spirit with God's church, and doing my best to make it a place where people feel welcome. Let's get back to Oakwood. Come on, let's go. Okay. So I get to Oakwood. When does when does Kemba become Miss? Mrs. She Kemba. becomes Mrs. Esmond. Probably, we graduate. I propose to her right before graduation. Then, <laughs> <laughs> then we head off to. I head off to graduate school. Now, you, you. I have to tell you this miracle. You have to hear this. I, I'm, I'm here for because it. Because literally, it, this is what this I'm is here, what for. here for. <laughs> so. so, I'm finishing school. And I've talked about law school. I haven't applied to anything. I haven't done anything. I'm just trying to finish school, and I figure, okay, I'll go home, and I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it squared away when I get home. You know, let me just get out, get out, and I'm done. You know. Um, but then I was in my dormitory, and a letter came to my room. The letter says, I open it up. It's from Pittsburgh State University. Mr. Esmond, uh, you have been accepted into Pittsburgh State University master's program, um, all expenses paid, and we will be making you a graduate assistant. You will be teaching English, freshman English, and we will pay you a stipend for that. Wow. Out of nowhere. I didn't even apply to the school. I later you didn't even apply to the school? Oh, no. Just literally random? Is no. this normal? This is not normal. Okay, I was going to say. There's okay. nothing normal. I've never gone to that. I've so. never had anything like this happen. I don't, I've never heard of it happening. But I later found out what, what actually happened. My department head, um, a woman who I love dearly, Dr. Leela Gooding, who was head of the Department of English during my time at Oakwood College, um, what is now Oakwood University, she submitted my name for a program, didn't even tell me. She didn't even tell me. And I got it. Wow. I got it. And so she was responsible for that blessing in my life. So off I, here I was now, headed off to graduate school. But then something else happened. This one even more consequential. I'm, I'm, you, know, you know how when you get to the end of your college life, you're ready to go. Your mind is not even fully there, you know. You're taking classes, but you, you, you know, the the the, f- the breezes <laughs> are blowing, April showers and May flowers, and all you can think about is graduation, and I'm out, you know. So I'm I've checked out, but I was walking by the English department at Oakwood, place where I'd spent a whole lot of my time, just walking by outside, going somewhere, and. One of my professors yells out the window, that's the guy, that's the guy right there, that's him. And she's pointing at me and she's yelling, Dwayne, come here, come here, come back. And I get, I turn around, come back in, and it's Miss Keena Henson, one of my journalism professors. I took journalism with her. And there's a gentleman sitting in, in the room with her, and she says, this is the young man. This is the young man you want. Lissa... I didn't even know who this guy was. He looked at me. He said, well, sir, what's your name? Give him my name. He said, "Uh, how would you like to become an intern at Review and Herald Publishing Association? Well, I know where you land here. (laughs) This is where we meet. This is where we meet. (laughs) So that summer, that's how my, my, my affiliation 
with this institution, Review and Herald Publishing Association so who was that begins. Man? That was Elder Stephen Ruff, okay. who was editor of Message Magazine at the time, had recently kind of just became editor. He brought me in as an intern, and he and Miss Carmela Monk mm -hmm. Crawford now, who is now editor, trained me. They kind of worked with me. Um, and and after that summer, I went to grad school, and then the review, not only did they bring me back after I was done with my uh, graduate program, but they hired Kemba, Kemba. in the finance department, um, and I think they really wanted her. Oh. They, they, they really wanted her. <laughs> they, they were tolerating me, but they uh, really wanted her. She the was, review was very blessed well, by your presence. We were blessed I mean, to Kemba be there. as well, but... Yeah. Well, praise God. But she was she had basically finished her M, uh, her her MBA. She was on her way to finishing her CPA even at that time. And so we kind of started our little lives there. And I worked there in different capacities for 21 years, ending as uh, vice president of editorial service over all of the content. But during that time is when I met the great Trent Truman. That'd be my husband. Trentertainment, as we yeah. used to call him. They love, he loves to throw his name, <laughs> his name into everything. Wherever he can get his name into something. That's very Trent-arresting. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's, so, got, it's gotten old to me after 21 years I of would marriage, bet, I would be bet fair. it's a little old by now. <laughs> but back then, we used to laugh. But I still love him. And, and he is a great, just a great person, a, a creative of the highest order. Um, and I just remember those sweet times we had, you know, getting to know Trent and Ron Pride and all the guys who were there at that time. And and um, working with Insight Magazine, Trent was the designer for Insight. So how did the you, journal. was that the first? No. What, what was the first thing you landed on when the you were there? The first thing was Message. Okay, Message Magazine. Yes, and then I worked for something called New Media Publication. So I worked with different kinds of media uh, at the Review and Herald. And then I came to back, really kind of back to message as uh, an associate editor. Um, a new editor came in. They needed someone who kind of knew, knew the ropes. Um, so I was associate editor there. And then I was tapped around 2002 to become editor of Insight Magazine. Yeah. The teen journal. Yeah, which. Let's talk a little bit about the Review and Herald days. We mm -hmm. both. We both were there uh, during the summer. I we did not there. work there. My husband did. Yes. Um, you worked there in that case. <laughs> <laughs> they were rough years. Um, there were a lot of good years, but they were rough years too. Yeah. I one of the ways that you and I connected mm -hmm. was through your desire to start creating social media mm. for Insight. Um, and I think yearly you would come back to me to say, hey, I, remember that proposal you I gave? I always wanted you. Could you like listen, work on that proposal I again? I always wanted you. You <laughs> were the social media maven. Like, Which is funny. Just, that was like 21 amazing. years ago. Um, uh, even then, you still, I mean, you're more amazing now, but yeah. you had. I've had more, more years in it. As we but, say <laughs> in the hood, you had game oh, even well, back then. You. Yes. Oh, I had game. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about the challenges sometimes mm. of working for the church. Sure. Um, it's hard to be innovative mm -hmm. sometimes in the church. It's sometimes mm -hmm. hard for you to get people to see this vision, mm -hmm. this beautiful thing that you've come through. Mm -hmm. How did that impact your time? Sure. Um, when I worked at Message, there was uh, that that was an innovative shop. Like we would we would try all kinds of crazy things, you know, just to get people the gospel. You try all kinds of things. Um, when I came to Insight, Insight was a much more dicey proposition um, because the magazine grew out of. Um, the 70s it was created kind of in the 70s and so there was there was always a concern about how um, circumspect it was being um, in terms of what it was teaching our young people um, so th there was always a, a lot of pressure around insight uh, the content is dealing with issues that kids have in the culture but we're scared to admit that they have that many of them uh, 
when we would, would the way we would drive the content of the magazine we would do a a uh, kind of a a contest for writers so all the academies and churches kids would send in numerous stories to us and we would use those stories as a part of the writing content for the for the for the magazine as well as stuff things that we would of course assign and purposefully write so the issues we were seeing coming to us were issues coming from Adventist children. Things that they couldn't talk to their parents about or things they were going through that they just had to address. And so we're trying to be responsive to that. But the person reading the publication is not the person buying the publication. So parents are or buying, sitting on the board or sitting on the board of the <laughs> church that will order it. Yes. Those are the ones that are that are making decisions. But the actual ministry is going to the children. And so that was a dichotomy that was very difficult. One of the things we envisioned very early as social media began to develop was to create a social media fellowship. And we actually created the first youth social media fellowship in the church. It was called the flow. And kids, would <laughs> and kids would come in there, you know, we were programming for it and doing different things with it. Um, but that was, contra that, that, that was pulling major teeth. Um, there, were, there were several points where changes need to, needed to be made. Um, we started to see uh, less and less manuscripts coming to us as kids began to become more digital and less, less paper driven. That's a change that that we did not negotiate very well because you know there wasn't there was not a good financial model in place so there were a lot of things that didn't happen there's there seems to always be this tension with the church with adapting new oh, man. things new technology oh, you have like no idea. like the i do <laughs> <laughs> yes you do actually you have an idea um, <laughs> but like they didn't really want to start no. social media channels no. like we weren't going to have a Facebook page because no. you know that why would we put money why? into Facebook why? and um, there was this this sense that we're just going to always you know do we're, how my parents we're gonna were do. with Adventists my generation was but it wasn't we now lived in a very digital very society different. and I didn't need to wait until camp meeting to go and buy my books <laughs> I could go to Amazon eventually yes. I could and yes. all of this changes yes. the way and sometimes it seems that um, we're a little delayed because we're scared of the prospect a little I'm, I'm trying to be very be generous gentle here. I'm being very gentle here which you should be. Um, because they are doing their best and and it's kind of what we said mm -hmm. there's no point in tearing it down I, no. I know that they no. are doing their best yeah. but um, there is fear and for good reason, many times there is mm -hmm. fear. Um, but sometimes we have to push past that fear to see what could be. Well, let me, can I, can I, I feel like we should pass the offering plate. <laughs> that was, that was the appeal. <laughs> and I'm ready to give my money. I mean, well, I'll take I, it. I cannot, <laughs> <laughs> I cannot tell you how much I agree with what you just, let me tell you how, how much I agree. Let me, let me say it this way. So my PhD study in the leadership uh, Department of, of Andrews University. Excellent program. Thank you. I think it is. Um, is on this very issue. I'm really? studying innovation in missional organizations, such as the church. What am I talking about? Why, why is it that we struggle to have sustained long-term innovation capacities within our institutions hmm. that are dedicated to addressing that very issue that that we don't just let things happen to us but like we happen to things why is yeah. it that we must always be reactionary reacting when we can know even today that certain technologies are coming they're going to upend certain things already. We know they're coming. Like the metaverse. We know it's coming. What do you, what do, I mean, what, are we ready for that? Are we, are we thinking about how we're going to set up shop there? I am. 
Just oh, so you know. See, I'm, I'm thinking about this. <laughs> that's why I wanted you in the flow because you would, you know, we would have been flowing even now. So, <laughs> but this is this is what you do. You know, you you think you you're 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 a person who's up on what's happening in the culture. You're up on where technology is going. Thank goodness for young people. Yes, and and <laughs> having some young people in your house too, it that definitely helps. That doesn't hurt. So, but but it's so critical that we leverage the. The, the ingenuity and creativity and the farsightedness of our youth and young adults who can tell us some of the things that are coming yeah. and then begin to program and prepare. Now, why is this critical? It's critical for the white estate. We are a, yes, we have, I think, probably the most amazing digital offerings. Right now, they're being used. Something in the neighborhood of 120 to 140 million people are doing digital things with us every single month. I mean, it's astounding what God is doing. Um, but we tend to be, you know, a print-based organization. And so we, we're operating in a video-driven world. In, in yes, a, we are. I mean, the reality of that, why, why are we, you know, we could have sat here and talked and done audio by itself, but uh, people are going to want to watch you and I talk. You know what well, I mean? Uh, we're, we're very fun. I would want to watch us. I would us. think so. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. When we have two views, we'll know why. It'll be my, <laughs> my mom, your mom. <laughs> Our parents. Our spouses didn't even go in. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough of them. So, but if you think about it, like this, 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 this thing, it, it is so critical for us that that our organizations prepare for what is to come, for what is coming. It doesn't mean you have to just throw money after bad money and, and, and experiment in ways that are not wise. We don't have all the money in the world. But money is no substitute, or the lack of money is no substitute for thinking. Mm. It is no substitute for research. It is no substitute for wisdom, and it's no substitute for the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is promised. You will hear a voice behind you saying, hey, church, this is what's coming. Prepare for it. You know what I mean? That's my adjustment to the, to, to the text. Sometimes sleeping on the job. I think so. So, one, I volunteer to... Um, <laughs> to proofread your Come dissertation um i actually really enjoy this I've, I've i get to read different people's dissertations oh, as they're working on them awesome. and um provide like a little feedback I, awesome. it's like literally one of my favorite things to do awesome. so just so you know I, i'm i'm I, here I, for it i'm should, totally you, here you for should it. not have said that to me Liz. <laughs> um We're, we're gonna move because i feel like we could just sidetrack on this area but that, i feel like this needs to be a whole nother podcast that I don't well, know where it falls in, but we need this podcast here. Whenever you want to talk about innovation here. in the church, we could talk. Oh, that would be that would be a very fun podcast we series. Could go, a whole thing on innovation and talking with innovators. And we've got those people. We do. We have amazing we've innovators. We've got those people. We do. Okay. All right. I love that we're just brainstorming <laughs> ideas while we're talking about about your life about journey. My life. I you were about, all of a sudden, I'm not, my life means nothing anymore. Oh, <laughs> yes, it is. You know, the, the nice part is that where we are age-wise. Yeah. Um, we're at the point now where we get to start mentoring and shepherding. Mm, it's not, amen. it's not, it's not about us anymore. It's no. about us trying to find the people that's, to invest that's in correct. for the next generation that's because correct. we're, we're not aging out. I mean, I'm aging we're out. in our forties, we, right? Right. Well, what? okay. Never mind. We're getting, we're in our forties. Some of us have crossed over, but we're in our forties. You, 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 you're still a baby. Um, well, but I, I have crossed over. Okay, so he's so. in forty fives. Um, <laughs> so, so I like we're in wish. the. Um, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but it's now we get the yeah. privilege of pouring into the next generation, Absolutely. and they need people who are innovative and in thinking, who are open and willing to listen. So mm -hmm. I, I love this. But um, <sighs> the review and Harold mm -hmm. sadly comes to an end, Oof. and Adventist institution you don't have enough time no we're, we're not going to explore this one you don't, um you don't there will there would be tears easily the hardest experience of my life easily what how did that impact you <laughs> that that devastated me that devast that devastated me that is still with me today that devastated my whole existence like it shouldn't have i'd like to tell you that i was super christian and ready i thought i was but 
that was a slow moving dissolution. I was a vice president in charge of an entire staff of people, many of whom taught me my job. Hmm. And then I had to let them go. It was a hard batch by batch. It was a hard process because my husband yes. worked with you yes. and he was in yes. the f one of the first yes. waves of the layoff. It just and um, it was painful to watch this, this institution that had been founded. This church came out of yeah, that institution. It was before the church existed. <laughs> you know, like it's the Review and Herald you Publishing Association. You could not put it into words. Now, what what we say today is it ceased, you know, its operational mm, yeah. plant in Hagerstown. But in reality, at least for that period of time, it was closed. It closed. Um, and it was for for me. Um, I, I got to see raw sides of the church, raw sides of how things are done that weren't that weren't good for me. I came out of that situation, you know, basically saying I'm done. I made sure that. You know, I, I got as many of my people hired as I could, um, just about everyone. I found them places or supported them, made sure. And basically on the day when I got my executive assistant uh, taken care of, I think I left that same day. Uh, I, was, I was done. But the blessing is God is not done. <laughs> that even when we are done, God is not done. And I remember telling God, you know, Lord, I'm not going to really work. Uh, I'm, I've done my time. 21 years, 20 years is enough. Um, I'm, I'm separating from church work. And through a see, I, I wish I could tell you the miracles, but I remember telling Elder Jim Nix, who came through the GC, you know, at the time. And who was, who was he? he? Elder Jim Nix is at the time was uh, director of the LNG White Estate. Um, and he came by, you know, collecting artifacts and surveying different things that <laughs> that the, the Review and Herald had for preservation. Um, and he visited with me. We had worked on different things together, of course. And uh, he said, hey, you know, would you ever consider, you know, working at the uh, White Estate? There's a colleague, you know, who will probably move on at some point. And uh, would you consider it? And I told him. I think I remember telling him, you know, Elder Nix, I, I'm not in, I'm not in a good place. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not good right now. I'm not sure you would want me, you know, in my current state. And he said, oh, no, I understand that, but you know, maybe in the future. And I told him then, I said, well, Elder, I would. This will probably be the only place I would work. It's the White Estate. I would do that. It's interesting when you think about it. This boy from New Jersey. He takes his Bible and mind, <coughs> character, and personality, volumes <laughs> one and two, <coughs> to Pine Forge to Academy. Academy. Yep. Who fully plans to become a lawyer. Yep. And how God maneuvers, not, he doesn't maneuver, but he allows a journey mm -hmm. to unfold that takes this, this young man mm -hmm. and places him at a place mm -hmm. where he can now impact others through the same writings that impacted him mm -hmm. and help them fall in love with them. It's a fact. When you got your call mm -hmm. to the Ellen White estate, um, how did that feel? <laughs> I was amazed. The, the confluence of circumstances that made it happen were beyond I can't even put it into words. Some I can say, some I can't say. Um, it, it was, it could only have been God. Let me just put it, it could only have been God. And after it had was over, like a year or two later, some people who were in on that decision shared with me how things really went down. <laughs> they gave me a behind the scenes look. Sometimes those behind the scenes looks are pretty. Uh, they are <laughs> frightening, but you know, they spoke about how how people supported 
my um, candidacy and my nomination and and how this Holy Spirit just moved in that room. I didn't know that, you know. So it 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 was God working to put me, I think, back into his work. Um, he allowed me a period of time For to healing. healing, to heal. And I was able to get my, I mean, my body had broken down. My spirit was broken. I was physically hurt. Uh, I mean, I was me I was messed up, herniated disc, all kinds of stuff was wrong with me. Uh, but God gave me some time and the love of a great woman. Um, she loved me. She loved me through that pain uh, and gave me time and encouraged me not to give up and to keep on going. And so I think after after a time, the Lord allowed me to come back into service in a place that I absolutely love and adore, um, doing work that I believe in, hanging around truth that I absolutely believe in, um, and then to be able to shepherd this wonderful treasure of Spirit of Prophecy writings, Ellen White's uh, uh, bit of them, because the whole, the whole project of the Bible is a spirit of prophecy Fair. writing. <laughs> um, but the Ellen White section of them that I get to work with, uh, that God would allow me to come back into his service and work with those same writings is beyond words. Um, I had no clue what he was up to, but, you know, Ellen White says that if we could... I'm paraphrasing her. She says something like, if we could see the end, end from, from the, the beginning, beginning, we would have it no uh, other way. You know, and discern the purposes that God is up to. We would not choose to be led any differently than he has led us. Isn't that incredible? Like, that's a and that's, that's really what these stories are. Shocking. That, that's really what Anne and Profiles is about, mm -hmm. is helping people to see this whole journey. And I find that a lot of people, as they're telling their stories, it's, it's this beautiful reflection in their own mind mm -hmm. to see how God brought them where they are. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to name mm -hmm. one book, I know this is hard, okay? Drum roll. <laughs> Mind, character, and personal. No, um, right, no. <laughs> if you were to name, we have a generation now. Yes. Who who I genuinely believe mm -hmm want to stay in the church i do too i believe that they want a reason to stay not a reason to leave yes but there's a lot mm -hmm. there's I a mean, lot there is a lot, a lot that is pushing against them there's a lot in the way yeah if you could suggest one book by ellen white mm -hmm. to help them fall in love with just had to have a personal personal relationship mm -hmm. with the very person who came down here Mm -hmm. and die to have a personal relationship with them. Mm -hmm. What book would you recommend? Mm. I don't think that's even hard. Like, that's easy. <laughs> For me, it would be Steps to Christ. Really? I think Steps to Christ <laughs> is uh, an amazing book. I think it's, it's bite-sized enough that you could digest it. There are modern versions of it, Steps to Jesus and others. Um... It's available in audio and all kinds of stuff, so you can access it different ways. Where, where but, do they, f if they wanted to sure. find the audio, where would they find it? You could go. You can to, totally do a plug right now. Yes, Dwayne. you can go to egwwritings.org, um, or the uh, egw writings two app. Has egw it writings two. Yes. Okay. Two. The the actual app available on all all of the wherever you you get your apps. Um, that's a very powerful resource that, that is just amazing, the things that we're doing there. And it's available, different forms of it available, and of course in audio there. And I'll tell you why this book, um, among others, is, is very special. So I, I've always loved the book. Um, I like all of Ellen White's <laughs> work, but... <laughs> Um, let me let me tell you why this thing has gotten so me it got it's gotten meaningful to me. So, in 1888, at the Minneapolis General Conference session of our church, um, that's called the Righteousness by Faith Conference. Yep. 
there was there was you know some stuff happened there. Uh, <laughs> That's a really nice way to put it. <laughs> some th- some, there was some things going down. Some things <laughs> went down. So, if you El- aren't familiar with what happened, I recommend <laughs> <laughs> George Knight's book. <laughs> oh man, absolutely. So, Ellen White um, sides with these two young adults, Jones and Wagner. Jones and Wagner in the church that. You know, this law is just a schoolmaster. It's just a mirror. It can't save. Um, that we're too law oriented. And we need that our righteousness is of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Um, she's she's going up against towering figures in the church, Uriah Smith, G. I. Butler, and others. Mm. So the older versus the younger is at play. And Ellen White goes with the with the young people. Well, I didn't sit too well with a lot of people. And right around 1891, the church kind of votes her off the island. <laughs> like almost literally. <laughs> they send her to one, actually. They send they her. They voted her to an island? To an rather, island. Rather than off the island, to the island. <laughs> they send her very, very 64 years old. You know, <sighs> at the time when she should probably be looking to settle down somewhere they send her and she later writes you know she had absolutely no light that god had called her to australia the land down under she had no light she brought that to elder i think it was robert olson elder olson maybe in 1896 or so um but she said you know because god's church has voted and spoken Hmm. i will do it now, Which is crazy if you think about it. 64 well, years old, but being willing to say, God is, hasn't said anything different, so I'm willing to thing. go. This is the thing about Ellen White. That's that's That blesses my soul. Whenever I feel like I want to, you know, go crazy in the church, I think, well, they voted her off, and she's the, you know, she's the founder. You know, she and James and Joseph Bates and Hiram Metzen, you know, they're at the core. And... When they do something that is not what she believes is right, she still goes. And what do we have as the fruit of that engagement? Well, all over that that Pacific, that, that area there where those, you know, all those little islands in New Zealand and all that, we have ministry down there because a woman was thrown down there and she went in obedience to we God. We have Avondale. Which she was able to build off of this the vision that she had for education and finally be able she to was really able be to able to do it. Implement it. And there. it was in Australia in her um Exile. Exile. Right. <laughs> a better word. During her exile, she <laughs> builds this premier education institution in Avondale. Absolutely. How Avenist education should be. Indeed. Sanitarium Sanitarium Foods. Mm-hmm grows out of the same uh, health ministry uh, ethic of Ellen White on that. I mean, one of the biggest food companies anywhere in the world today, number one in Australia today. But something else happens. So, a, a, a small, thin? Some, some some other things happen down there. Small, thin book that yes. is pretty, pretty impressive. There's a little <laughs> book that comes out right around that time. Steps to Christ, which she had been working on, but that book comes out during that period of her life. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about these these years that were so difficult. And the, when, when she arrives there, Ellen White was so sick that she almost died. Her son reports it, she reports it. But she says something interesting about that time. She said that is when she was nearest to Jesus. Was so in in exiles when she felt nearest. I'm, I'm, Although I mean, exiles maybe a little bit of a strong it's a word. Strong, but 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 we get the point. When there's tension when, within the the structure. Yes, when her life has diverged and they send her about as far away as they could, as they could, <laughs> without dropping her off the side of the earth. You know, they when the church has hurt her, she. Mm. Mm is nearest Mm. to Jesus. And it is at that period of time in her life that we get all the books on Jesus. Desire of Ages? Yes, man. Comes out of this time. Steps to Christ. Comes out of time. Christ Object Lessons. Christ Object Lessons. 
thoughts for the amount of blessings. blessings. All of them. So you're basically kind of just doing a litany of my favorite books. I'm just trying to tell you. <laughs> actually, the the interesting thing is um, you can see that actually sometimes it's when we're in, in our hardest moments is actually when we can feel the closest to Jesus. That's the point I'm trying and to make. And that she is able to write this deeply beautiful. I mean, those books are some of her best. I mean, in my oh, opinion. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely the best There's books. There's no question. You can sense this genuine just relationship adoration she knows jesus awe. yeah to use a an old term mm -hmm. this the fear of the lord that's, that's this right. awe of god that's right you can see it in her writings <laughs> and sometimes you can only feel that if you're going through hard times and you learn when all of, all of the other supports are knocked out and all you have is jesus god and God alone <laughs> when hmm. you get to that point sometimes and not that God always has to take us there but but he allows that that time because it is often fruitful for our relationship with him and when you read those books I don't think you can come away from there and not see Ellen White knows God so for me steps to Christ is is, is one of the most sweetest simplest distillations of the gospel about what it means to live a spiritual life, what to do with your doubts, how to rejoice within God, that the chapter on 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 faith and acceptance, mm. just mm -hmm. accepting oh, what yes. Jesus has done, the consecration chapter. I mean, I love the chapter on prayer too. Prayer. I'm sorry. Like, I, well, I mean, how do you even pick which chapter? Page one hundred, man. Oh. Opening the, the heart. opening of the yes. heart to God as to friend. <laughs> yes. Not. You cannot weary oh. him. You I know, feel like we're just preaching sermons here. I, I feel <laughs> like when you get that down in your system as a young person, I think if you just if you just contemplate those words. Th that that quote life changing. From the privilege of prayer. Mm -hmm. Um is something I actually learned in my coal portering years mm. while I was selling this book. And has carried with me through so many times because I realized that I don't have to be super like, mm -hmm. oh, heavenly father, like what God wants me to come to come him to and talk to him. Come to me. And um, it's such a beautiful thought. I we need we're starting to wrap this up here. Sure. But there is something that's kind of like here where you're at in your journey right now mm -hmm. that I don't want us to neglect to talk about mm. because it was born out of personal experience. Mm -hmm. You have a son now. I Remind do. me of his name. DJ Dwayne Jr. DJ. Okay. I, I don't know how I forgot that. That's all okay. Right. It is. People are struggling to stay in the word of God mm. and there are a million things. I, I have my phone right here. Dwayne, since we've been talking, <laughs> some things have happened. Yes, I, I, wow. I, <laughs> let's not actually talk about how many things have happened since we've been talking. That's all. That, that's my, tonight. Mine, that's for my, tonight. Mine is sitting <laughs> off in the darkness somewhere. I, I couldn't even have it over here with me. Um, um, well, I hide mine in the box upside what? down so I don't even see it flashing. But um, <clears throat> you brought to the you you had a heart mm -hmm. a, a conviction within your heart mm -hmm. that family worship matters mm -hmm. and we weren't doing enough mm -hmm. to support our members mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i don't think this was just a oh i have it all together and <laughs> i am so amazing and everybody in my home we just adore all of this um moment that that was not mm -hmm. how this was born no you and I have talked about this because I have the privilege of serving on a small committee. Yes. It's called Back to the Altar. Back to the Altar, yeah. Um, and it's born out of a personal struggle. And we don't have a ton of time, but yeah. can you just share a little bit? What is this? What is the struggle? And what are we trying to do? Sure. Well, the struggle is the struggle is really the fight to be with God the struggle to be in God's presence minus a lot of things um, the Bible says in, in the book of I think it's in the book of Proverbs that God has made man upright 
But man, human beings, have sought out many inventions. It's a powerful scripture, but what it simply means is that God has made us a certain way, but we get creative. <laughs> and we, not in the way we want to be creative. <laughs> in the best of ways. <laughs> this is right? not the innovation we were talking <laughs> a about. Different kind of, we, we divert ourselves many times, and things we, things we create divert us from the need to be one with God. And one of those things I feel is how we use technology and media. I think the studies are telling us it's having a tremendous effect on our minds, specifically how we think, how we reason, our capacity even to enjoy face-to-face -face communication, enjoy fellowship. Um, our retention capabilities for the Word of God and other things are being severely affected. and. I noticed this pattern in my life. I noticed my my desire for worship and my desire for time with God has been frittered away. It's and this is a person who is professionally in ministry, right? But 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 so be, you mean people who are professional in ministry don't have their acts all together? I, I think that's what yes okay. yes. Um, I, I'll I'll just claim myself. It's okay. You can claim me because you already know else. where I'm at. <laughs> you and I have talked about yes. this, but that, that this has actually helped us. Yes. That this is this is tr this is beginning to work reformation in my life, but I feel like you know, hey man, you you need to stop and take stock of where you are with your with your devices, where you are with your time, uh, the, the the talent of which God will, Ellen White says, will exact the most strict account. Time, Ouch. what have we done with our time? Um, and when I look at my life and how much I'm into so many other things other than what I should be in. Uh, coupled with a couple of things, some statistics that w that came from our 2018 World Adventist Survey, which showed that only 52% of Adventists have any kind of devotional life, and only 37% of Adventist families have morning and evening worship. And and uh, and something went off in my brain, and I just I I immediately understood that statistic as very much a part of my own life. Uh, we are we are we are not with God, even though we are supposed to be sharing the gospel of God. Mm. We are not worshiping God consistently, but yet we have a worship-centered message that we must deliver. So how does an end-time church with a worship-centered message deliver that message when it's not even worshiping at its own altars? So what it's trying to do is trying to profess what it does not practice. Ouch. It's trying to somehow manufacture what God wants to manifest hmm. through it. And I, he pointed the finger right at me. Thou art the man, Esmond. You are not really with me. You're not even comfortable with me, minus your stuff. We, you and I are supposed to have unmediated conversation, like Adam and Eve had in Eden. I'm not saying that, the, that that my device can't help me. It helps me. I worship with it. But I shouldn't always have to worship with it. I shouldn't always have to be looking at things. Maybe I need to go analog and pull out my old scripture and just open that thing on up. Studies tell us that the learning that comes that way is different from the learning that comes yep. digitally. It's more sticky over here than it is over here. It's just retained differently. Uh, all of that is, matters to me. So w this initiative, the Back to the Altar initiative that the church has now voted and that is the next five years uh, we're going to be focused on is all about rejuvenating that personal walk with God. And I'm going to tell you why that's critical, Lisa. That's important to me because there's some things you get that only come from God. I feel, I feel a little Ellen coming on. Okay, um, go for it. But she talks about the spiritual life of the Christian when separated from God. What follows is spiritual declension and then spiritual death. Mm. Separation is death. You just might not know it. You look like you, you're doing fine, but in actuality, We're not. you have a form of godliness you have denied, denied the power, power and you don't have what you think you have. And there's nothing, Alyssa, like don't having, not having the power when you need it. 
I'm telling you what I know what I'm I know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sitting down with people whose lives are breaking or in a hospital with somebody whose loved one is is headed to the grave or or some situation comes upon you and you know I have not been with God. Hmm. But this person needs a God oriented. They need a person in their presence right now who can speak life into their death. Now, I don't know about you, but that bothers me. I've had that experience. And I don't like the feeling. So when we come into the presence of God, the Bible says there is fullness of joy. But there's other stuff we get. We get power. I'm a little power hungry. We get, we don't just get his power, we get his provision. Wherever God shows up, everything needed comes with him. We get his protection. Hmm. We get his protection. We get his prescription. For whatever is ailing us in them, whatever the situation is, that comes with God. And that starts at your altar. That's why Jesus could do what he did during his life, where he could just walk out into the day and say, bring it. You know? So, so the church is working on creating, I hate to use the word tools. But resources. Resources, tools. Yeah to be able to help everybody no matter where you are Worship in your spiritual revolution. journey um for those of you who are struggling and you you crave something but you don't know how to get it mm. we're creating something for you for some people who like they don't even know they need it mm -hmm. but there's like this little bit of something we want to create something for them um i'm gonna put a plug in for something here plug. okay plug away um if you are listening to this mm -hmm. There will be a Back to the Altar podcast. Coming? Coming soon. To an app store near you. <laughs> so um, where we're going to be having mm -hmm. conversations, kind of like yes. you and I were having, but yes. rather than it being a personal journey, we're going to be talking about worship yes. and, and how to praise and how yes. to get into the word and the struggles and the challenges and, and all this. And, and it'll be another authentic conversation because... We want to stop putting on mm -hmm. facades. Mm -hmm. We want to start being more authentic. Mm -hmm. Christ came and he was authentic was with us. He was real. It we was should genuine. do nothing less. Amen. Um, so for those of you Something listening, um, it's coming back to the altar um, podcast. The we want podcast. you to tune in because it'll be fantastic. A blazing grace. It's going to be amazing. A blazing grace? A blazing grace. Okay, Not just no. amazing grace. It's, it's a blazing grace. We great. want a blazing grace. Okay, right. Because it's, yeah. If, yeah, okay. We Fabulous. We want it to be awesome for God. Dwayne, thank you for thank coming you. and spending this time with me. Thank and I just you, want Alyssa. you to know that um, listening to your journey has reminded me of the importance of speaking life into others. Mm -hmm. Um, you've talked about how so many people invest and spoke this life into you. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me, I actually want to reach out to my music teacher and <laughs> let him know that yep. he gave me life. Yep. Um, so it's not just, you know, speaking life into people who are younger than us mm -hmm. as people have done for us, but also mm -hmm. letting people who know mm -hmm. how they have impacted it and influenced mm -hmm. us. Absolutely. Always take every opportunity to say thank you. Well, I want to say I'm it now big then. On that. I want to say thank you to you. I want to thank you. One, you. No, 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 first me. Oh, Lord. All right. You were one of the first people to have seen mm. what God was working on within me. Amen. You were one of the very first pe person. It was so clear. Who who saw my talents and saw my gifts and even though we couldn't oh, we couldn't yes. utilize them, you kept pushing me to be better what? and you kept encouraging me and telling me that the church needed my talents Phew. absolutely and i never forgot that Praise god. i never forgot that Praise and god. even when i was in my as i call them the midian years when you aren't really <laughs> like you know where yeah. where you're learning the talents god yeah. is needing for a different time yes. um that always stuck with me and i just want to thank you Praise for god. the life affirming words you spoke into a 22 year old young person wow who knew she wanted to work for the church, but wow. had been told the church had no place for her. <laughs> so thank you, because I am partially here because you spoke those words wow. to me. Wow. 
Listen, you're trying to make me cry. Don't do this on this. Don't can do I? this on this. Can podcast. I get you to cry? Stop it. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm I'm incredibly uh, touched and moved uh, by your your statements, and I just I, I just praise God for you. Um, I'm glad that He led me to say the things. They were from my heart, and I meant every word. And I still. You know I'm I'm a I'm an Alyssa Truman fan. You you know you're the one of the only people, by the way, who I calls am, me Lissa. I call Do you know you that? Lissa. My mom, my dad, <laughs> and Dwayne <laughs> Esmond. I don't know why. <laughs> I love please, it. Never change. Forgive me. No 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 no. Never change. It actually is super special. It to is me. But it's funny. My mom, I, my dad, and me. Not even my siblings. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's so natural for me to call you Lissa, but I just thank God for for what He has done in your life. I have watched your ministry, watched your growth, your development, and what you do for God even now. It's just so amazing um, that I feel like, uh, as 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 awesome as you know what you've done is has been, um, that the best from you is yet to come. And the other thing I love about you is, you live a real spiritual life. Your walk is 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 legit. It's real. And you and I have broken bread over the good, the bad and the ugly. The authentic. It's real. Yep. And I can't I can't thank God enough that I get to work in his church with a servant like you. You are top shelf. I want you to know that. Thank you, Dwayne. God bless you. So for those of you listening or watching, um, I want to actually encourage you to take a few minutes find somebody who has impacted your spiritual journey send them a message call them text them email them send a carrier pigeon if that's the only way you can reach them whatever it is find a way to mm. to speak words of life Amen. into um into their lives thank you so much for joining me today um and Dwayne. It's, it's been, been an such a privilege and we want to thank you for your time because we know mm -hmm. that everybody's time is valuable so yes, thank sorry. you for spending this time with us honored um, honored that they would i want to encourage you to subscribe to however you're listening to this whether on a podcast or a youtube channel take a few minutes hit that subscribe button so you don't miss another story as we continue to hear Amazing. how god has moved through the leaders of the seventh day adventist church Thank you for coming, and um, we look forward to hearing or listening or talking with you again. Watching very, <laughs> whatever it is, talking <laughs> with you very soon.